Hi, it's Dr. Hagmeyer here, and if you're watching this on my website, I'm, I'm glad you found us. If you came across this on my YouTube channel, I hope you will find value in the information I'm going to be sharing with you. Uh, in my last video, I talked about 10 clues that you might have SIBO and when to get uh, tested for that. Today, we're going to continue this video series and, and talk about uh, a very special test called the hydrogen methane breath test, how it's used in detecting SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And a couple of other things that I want to talk and address in this video is the difference between uh, the different kinds of tests, like the glucose breath test versus a lactulose breath test. I'm also going to share with you some of the limitations of each one because, again, uh, they definitely do provide different kinds of information, and knowing which one to use at which uh, time and for what reason uh, will be very, very beneficial. Um, if you or someone you know suffers with IBS, you know the daily struggles and challenges that many people simply take for granted. Uh, but with this test, you might finally start getting on a path that can lead to just a drastic improvement in your symptoms and ultimately uh, change, change your life, okay? Um, depending on which study you read, anywhere between 50% to 80% of people that have been already diagnosed with IBS have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or SIBO. Now, it might seem odd that you're collecting your breath to see what's going on uh, with a problem in the gut, so I'll explain that in a little bit, but first off, um, it's important to understand that within our large intestines, we have an environment that's teeming with bacteria. And this is what we call the microbiome. And the primary function of this microbiome and the colonic bacteria um, making up this, this microbiome is the fermentation of non-digestible carbohydrates and starches that result in the formation of something called short-chain fatty acids. So when we eat uh, carbohydrates, when we eat starches um, and plant material, that needs to be broken down into, or will be used to feed um, the bacteria that live in our guts, okay? And these are called short-chain fatty acids. And there's many, many benefits to short-chain fatty acids. I'll, I'll talk about some of those and, and do a whole video on those. But for right now, short-chain fatty acids are really the fuel sources that stimulate healing and stimulate repair within the gut lining, okay? Recently, uh, there's been an increasing number of studies showing that short-chain fatty acids can affect the metabolic uh, syndrome. Uh, they can affect things like cancer. They can affect things like ulcerative colitis. They can affect things like Crohn's disease. Um, they can be uh, associated with antibiotic-associated diarrhea. And so again, the primary function of the small intestines, uh, as opposed to the large intestines, is the digestion and the absorption of nutrients from the food that we eat. Okay, so again, there's a big difference between the functionality of the small intestines and the large intestines, okay? Um, as it relates to the small intestines, the bacteria that live there, or, or really shouldn't live there, uh, but live in the, in the large intestines that migrate up into the small intestines, the purpose of these bacteria, of course, is the digestion and absorption uh, and to produce valuable nutrients, okay? So again, uh, we shouldn't have bacteria in the small intestine, but yet the small intestine's purpose is the digestion and the absorption of all the nutrients in our body. Uh, the other thing is, is that this is where we support gut immunity, and this is a major area of protection as it relates to invading organisms, okay? The small intestines, on the other hand, uh, approximately, uh, when we talk about uh, bacterial counts, okay, the small intestine uh, houses approximately 10,000 bacteria per milliliter of fluid, okay, as compared to the large intestines, which houses about 1 trillion bacteria per milliliter of fluid. So there's a tremendous difference between the bacterial populations of the small intestines versus the bacterial populations in the large intestines, okay? Um, and again, that's one of the key points I want you to remember because, um, again, it's not the numbers, but the fact of the matter is, is that, again, the large intestines have lots of bacteria, things like E. coli, Enterococcus species, Klebsiella, Proteus, uh, Moralibus, and then the small intestines, not so many uh, bacteria, unless, of course, we have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So again, small, intestinal, small intestine, not a whole lot of bacteria. Large intestines, lots of bacteria, okay? When we have SIBO, we have an overgrowth of this bacteria where the bacteria in the large intestines work their way up and into the small intestines, okay? The bacteria in our guts uh, feed off of these undigested carbohydrates and the starches, and in the process of doing that, uh, it creates this buffet, right? There's, a, there's just a, a, this, this smorgasbord of, of, of food um, and gases that get produced as a result of these, these foods not being properly broken down, okay? And of course, the two gases that become very important are hydrogen and methane and a newer gas called hydrogen sulfide, 
okay, that uh, we now is, is, are linking to small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. The reason we measure this from a breath test is that some of the gases produced by these bacteria are absorbed through the lining of the colon, where they now enter the bloodstream, and uh, from our blood, the gases make it to the lungs, where then they then are exhaled in our breath, and hence the name, that's why we call it a hydromethane breath test, okay? So again, that breath that we're collecting is looking at hydrogen and methane. So a breath test tells us really three things. It tells us which kind of gases are present, whether we're dealing with hydrogen or methane. Uh, it tells us the location of the overgrowth. Again, depending on the test we're looking at, the overgrowth may be in the upper portion of the small intestines. It may be in the lower portion of the small intestines. And then finally, it shows us the severity of the bacterial overgrowth in terms of numbers, okay? Now, if you're wondering about the third gas that I just mentioned earlier ago, hydrogen sulfide, or maybe you're reading about that on the internet, at this time that this video is being done, there is no testing for hydrogen sulfide yet. So again, I'm sure, you know, within the upcoming years, there will be some testing available for that. But at this point in time, um, we just don't have it, okay? So the point being here is, is you may be wondering why, again, uh, or, or why a breath test is needed or, or what a breath test looks like. So I want to show you an example of that. Uh, maybe you're at home watching this and you've already had a breath test done. So again, you're wondering what, what kind of sense you make out of that. So if you look at this breath test here, you're going to see that along the vertical axis, which is the up and down axis, numbers go from zero to 80, okay? Now this is the concentration or the amount of hydrogen and methane that's produced during the sample. Along the horizontal axis, which again is along the bottom of the graph, we have elapsed time and the number of samples that are collected. Okay? Now in this particular test, there are 10 samples that have been collected over 180 minutes. So the 180 minutes or this three hour breath test is really what is considered now the gold standard of testing according to the researchers uh, in the field of, of IBS and uh, malabsorption issues and small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. The thing that we want to understand here is that a positive SIBO breath test is a test that shows elevated levels of hydrogen or elevated levels of methane or even sometimes elevated levels of both. Okay, Some people do have elevated levels of both gases Okay, and that's not uncommon. The person that you see here this person is positive for both hydrogen and methane gas, okay? So this is a little bit more complicated than a case where it's only hydrogen, okay? In another video that I'll talk, I'll talk about the treatment for these because again, the reason why we test for these uh, ultimately is going to determine what kind of, of pathway we go down from a treatment standpoint, all right? So a person that's diagnosed with a positive methane test is going to require a different kind of treatment than say, a person with a positive hydrogen breath test. Again, there is some overlap, but again, different practitioners will do different things based on the results of that breath test. So again, this is the reason why I believe that testing is very important and not just treating SIBO based on a, a hunch or a suspicion or even based on the very nonspecific symptoms of bloating, gas, belching, uh, diarrhea, constipation. Um, I know that some functional medicine doctors uh, uh, who tell their patients to get tested um, uh, I'm sorry, they tell their patients not to get tested um, for this reason, okay? But I think that testing is, is really a, an invaluable resource here when you're dealing with this, okay? So again, it is my opinion, um, and again, not a, a good idea uh, to not get tested because like I mentioned earlier, depending on the type of bacteria that are producing the hydrogen or methane, uh, again, the treatment could be different. So we don't want to nuke everything in the gut microbiome if we don't have to, okay? Again, of course, uh, again, based on hunches. The last thing I want to talk about uh, in today's video is really the difference between a lactulose breath test and a glucose breath test, and of course the pros and the cons of each. Again, each of these tests has their limitations that you obviously should be aware of. And again, the reason I tell you this is that if one test is negative, let's say a lactulose breath test was done and it was negative, many doctors will tell you that you don't have SIBO. And uh, unfortunately, that's just not the case. It's, it's not that simple in many times. Uh, again, while one test may be negative for a lactulose breath test, if you were to follow that up with a glucose breath test, that test may show up being positive. Okay, So sometimes you actually need to do two tests, Okay, both tests. So let me explain the difference between a glucose uh, hydrogen breath test and a lactulose breath test. Uh, first off, uh, when we talk about the small intestines, it's important to understand your small intestines are 20 feet long. Okay, And the reason I tell you this is that depending on the kind of breath test that you use, whether you use a glucose or a lactulose breath test, you're only going to be able to um, test or evaluate either the uppermost portion of the small intestines 
or the lowermost portion of the small intestines, okay? One test cannot evaluate both areas, okay? The glucose breath test um, for SIBO is very, very specific to the uppermost portion of the small intestines, okay? This is the section uh, where the stomach empties into uh, the small intestines. And of course, um, when we talk about a lactulose breath test, this test is better at assessing uh, the distal portion or the lower end of the small intestines, okay? The section that empties now into the large intestines. So remember, we have 20 feet of intestines. A glucose breath test is better for the bacterial overgrowth in the upper portion of the small intestines. And the lactulose breath test is better for the lower portion of the small intestines or small bowel, small bowel okay? Both lactulose and glucose, again, are types of sugars. Certain kinds of bacteria in the gut digest these sugars and produce gas, uh, again, hydrogen or methane as one of their byproducts. Again, so those gases are really what we're measuring in that hydrogen breath test, whether it be glucose or methane, okay? Now, the upside to a glucose breath test uh, that we just talked about is that it's more accurate, okay? Researchers have found that it's just much more accurate at detecting the presence of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. The downside is that in most cases of SIBO, the, uh, the, 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 the diagnosis, or I should say the, the, the likelihood of, of having SIBO is in the smaller part or the distal part of the small intestines. So again, we have the upper part and the lower part. The lactulose breath test is much more um, sensitive to detecting uh, SIBO in the lower part of the small intestines, which is where we find the majority of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth being, okay? So again, a negative glucose uh, breath test only is negative for, an upper, for the overgrowth pattern in the upper part of the small bowel. Um, and again, the lactulose breath test, um, again, is, is uh, more sensitive to picking up in the small intestines. All right, so the problem with the lactulose breath test is that, it, again, it's not as accurate as a glucose breath test. But again, it diagnoses it. I'm saying this a lot, many times because I know without a, a picture here that if, if, you're not, if the picture doesn't show up here, it's going to be difficult following this, okay? So again, the vast majority of cases of SIBO, small intestines, all right? So that's going to wrap up today's video. I hope you found it helpful. I hope you learned a few things from this. Uh, a couple of reminder points as we close today's video. If you or your doctor uh, orders a SIBO breath test, again, make sure that it's the three-hour breath test, not a two-hour test, okay? Um, by the way, these tests can be done at home, okay? So I didn't talk too much about that, but these tests can be done at home. You don't need to spend three hours in a doctor's office. Um, I simply have uh, a lab uh, mail my patients the test kit, and so the patient, you know, has the instruction. There's videos to do it. It's very easy to do it. It's not a very difficult test to perform. It's nice to do it at home because, again, you probably have better places to spend three hours than in your doctor's office, okay? One thing, I, again, I, that I want to say uh, is that there is a very specific SIBO test preparation, okay? So, and that needs to be followed because many times, and, and you wouldn't even be, you'd be shocked at how many times um, doctors have patients run this SIBO breath test and the test was not done properly. They did not follow the SIBO test preparation. So again, please be sure if you are getting tested, that you follow the precautionary steps um, to doing that SIBO breath test. Otherwise, you're not going to get accurate test results, okay? So there is a video that I did on that. I suggest you go back, you watch that video. Um, again, there's a lot of uh, clinical uh, importance in watching that video and, of course, the precautions that kind of go along with it. So there you go. I hope you uh, can appreciate this video. I hope you enjoyed it. And um, if you did, please comment below. Tell us what you thought about the video. And uh, make sure that you subscribe to this video series because, like I said, we're going to be going through lots and lots of, of really clinical and important points um, to the successful outcome of SIBO. And remember, whoever you decide to work with, again, this is something that hopefully that they're knowledge about and that they can order you the correct test. So until next time, take care.